Welcome to Unit 3 of EDSE 512. We are in luck this week because we're going to be diving into some more information about assessment, and particularly we will examine different types of assessments. So obviously in some situations one assessment will be appropriate or necessary and another won't. This is going to be information that will help us to decide what to use and when when we're assessing a student. We can gather some really unhelpful and perhaps even inaccurate information about a student and his or her skill sets if we're not choosing the appropriate assessment and utilizing it in the appropriate fashion, reliable and valid, as we were discussing in the previous unit. So we will have a Unit 3 discussion coming up, and you all have been doing a really nice job engaging in those. Same concept, same structure for the posting deadlines, and you will want to ensure that you're doing that APA 7th edition source citation so that we're supporting those discussion statements with evidence. That really moves our discussion from a conversation into an academic, uh, true, rigorous discussion where we are expanding, sharing our viewpoints, and supporting them with evidence. So I appreciate you doing those citations. Uh, it also just helps us to integrate our reading. We want to make sure that those are not separate from what we're doing in the online course shell, that they really do support one another. So that's an opportunity for you as you read to just be looking for relevant quotes, terms, and passages that you can blend into our discussion. So this week we've got a pretty large PowerPoint here. We won't go through the entire thing because it does move over the various types of assessment. One thing that we'll be focused on here is formal versus informal assessment. So formal assessment obviously would be the testing that we might do. For instance, if we're evaluating a student for special education initial eligibility or for re-evaluation to continue eligibility in special education or to not continue. Um, so an example of one of those might be the Woodcock-Johnson or the Wyatt, an academic evaluation. You might see some of those that are then producing those standard scores. And that formal assessment is being used to make educational decisions and um, it is based on comparison to other scores across the population. Whereas the informal assessments would be, uh, you could look through a portfolio and records that you might have. You could be doing interviews and observations. You might be using a rating scale. So these might be more of your benchmarks. You may be using these for more of the progress monitoring kind of informally as you go along. If you're teaching a lesson, your informal assessment might be a little check-in or even an exit ticket. It could be um, just questions that you ask along the way and the types of re results or responses that you're getting and whether those are accurate. And then the formal assessment would be the unit test. So you might do a quiz or a test at the end of that class day, that lesson, or at the end of a unit, for instance. And that data would then be combined with the data that you're gathering from informal assessments to make sure that everybody's on track. And you can adjust your instruction or your planning based upon the information that you're gathering from formal and informal assessments. And this would also be related to IEP goals, making sure that we're on track with the IEP goal that's appropriate. And if the student is excelling in that area, how can we adjust it to make it more rigorous? Or if it's unrealistic, how can we kind of go back to the drawing board and see what kind of skills we might be missing that are foundational to the goal skill that we're trying to work on? So you'll see many different slides about formal and informal assessment, and that really is what we just talked through, formal assessment, the concept of standardized testing, list of several examples for you there, and then informal assessments just being used in the classroom routine. You can use these at any time, and it's not to compare to the large population, but simply to indicate the student's performance in a given area or skill at a given time. So that's a good PowerPoint for you to review, um, but there are many slides, as I mentioned. There is a part two here, so you can pull that up in PDF format. And this will be information for you on selecting tests and how we're going to 
pick the appropriate assessment depending upon the situation. So this does include the criteria for the test selection. We want to make sure that the test is suited for the purpose. So what are we trying to find out? And that's where that validity comes in. Reliability is that we are testing and getting the same thing each time, but validity is that we are testing what we want to test. And if we are not using the right criteria for a test selection, then that might be giving us a problem. Um, an example of this is, let's say that we're assessing for skills in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, but we're giving the student a bunch of word problems. And let's say the student actually has a specific learning disability in reading, which may be undetected or we've not uh, yet gone through that process. So the student is scoring really poorly in the word problem assessments and we're then saying, oh, he or she has a major mathematical problem, but that may not at all be the case. So that's just kind of a basic example. We need to make sure that we're selecting the test appropriate for the purpose, testing only the skills that we are attempting to review and assess. We also need to select practical tests. So we can't do 90 minute assessments, you know, every week on the exact same skill for the exact same test. We need to do things that will realistically move into the workday that we do have access to. And if we need access to something that is not at our site or within our district, we need to advocate for that to those who are responsible and see what other alternate options may be available to us in the meantime. Then we do need to ensure that assessment is accessible, and so that might be in the form of an adaptation or an accommodation, universal design for learning. So what types of expression options do we have? We want to allow for multiple modes of expression of knowledge. We want to provide content in a variety of ways and uh, avenues, and that is the universal design for learning consideration that we would be looking at there for accessibility. And then are we using the correct assessment process? So for instance, are we getting those base scores, those ceiling scores, see how high we can go before we're zeroing out on that skill and how low we need to go before we're seeing consistent mastery because that'll give us that foundation baseline point and really give us an accurate assessment result compared to just picking a body of problems and just testing there. So check out this presentation as well. Again, more information on formal and informal assessment. This is what we just talked through, but you've got a visual here with examples or characteristics of formal assessments. They will be generally standardized, norm referenced, and then those informal assessments, they may be standardized, but they'll be incorporated into the learning routines and ultimately, um, they're generally just easier to do. It would be a smaller step in the assessment process. And then those formal assessments, several more examples here across content areas. These are lots of the assessments that you'll probably be seeing in the IEP in the present levels of performance when you're reviewing the results of the most recent evaluation, for example, or when you're doing the evaluation itself for eligibility or reevaluation for eligibility after that initial has passed. And this is a page with many examples of informal assess assessments. We just talked through the option of the observation, several different rating scales. Here's an article related to portfolio assessments. And we might be gathering a lot of different work samples from the student that then would give you evidence of the student's mastery in a given area. So that could be reading, writing, whatever you're looking for. You may have a portfolio. And again, just as mentioned in the presentation, we want to make sure that we're selecting the right test and taking into consideration culturally and linguistic, linguistically diverse backgrounds. So with that diversity, are we using culturally appropriate and informed and unbiased assessments? So there are a lot of questions here related to how we might evaluate a test. What do we need to think through? What kind of scores will this test or assessment present us with? And is that really what we're looking for? Just as we were discussing, will this take too long? Do we have access to it? Do I need to be trained and sit through 12 hours of professional development in order to get a certificate to give this assessment? Or is this something that I can just sit down and do and it'll be self-explanatory? That's what we need to know. 
So UDL, Universal Design for Learning Considerations, may also be considered for accessibility of the test. And this is a very important page. It's related to special education assessment for eligibility for services. And this is addressing the culturally and linguistically diverse population and performance on those assessments or cultural bias in assessment. This is a very hot topic in research. It's very important in the field right now that we're looking into this closely and avoiding this bias as much as we possibly can within the field. And any of that inappropriate eligibility or over identification for instance we need to look for any of that kind of inequity um, and make sure that we've got tabs on that and an eye on it to avoid bias so that's an important consideration in assessment we did hit on it in a discussion already but we're gonna see it coming up again um, this is an article regarding measuring or monitoring of progress for students, and it is from Wright's Law. So this is about tests and measurements for the parent, teacher, advocate, and attorney, and it is a PDF document. So you can take the time. There's an example, this story regarding a student named Shannon, and this is case law. It's important to know the difference between statutory law and case law. So reading off of a case that has occurred, we can look at the decision made within that case, and that will help us to identify the legally appropriate decision in future cases, even situations that we might encounter. So progress monitoring is very important for IEP goals. It can be difficult to fit into the schedule, so we're best off if we just create a routine and hit the ground running with that. We know how frequently we're going to be monitoring for progress on a given goal. We have the appropriate formal and informal assessments in place. We have a catch-all data collection tool that we can reference and access easily, and oftentimes people will do a drive spreadsheet or Excel or something of that nature. Uh, you can also do it on paper but you just have to be ready to transfer it electronically whenever that might be needed depending on the expectations of your school and your district. Progress monitoring is important because if we don't know where we stand on a goal we might be in a lot of trouble. The student may um, really be struggling in that area and maybe our interventions and our instruction is not meeting the students needs and then if we're progress reporting every semester for instance or every quarter we get to that formal IEP progress report and say oh my goodness we are going nowhere with this skill or it's we're worse off than we were at the baseline and that's not what we want to see we want to know how are we doing and be able to show a visual graph or data we always need numbers in that IEP progress report we give it to the family saying here's where we stood in this given month and by this time in the semester or the quarter here's where we stood and here's where we stand now and here's where we're trying to get and always compare that to baseline so progress monitoring is one of the most important parts of our job predetermination would be an issue of placement decision before the IEP team has met and discussed with that multidisciplinary team all of the factors related to the needs of that student. So we have to bring families into the mix obviously and get as much parental, parent or guardian input as possible and all of the relevant family members. We have to consider other alternatives. We have to give a draft to the family, but we can't make decisions about placement, for instance, within that draft. We've got to wait until that meeting, and oftentimes a meeting will go a way that we did not expect it to. So that's why we need to avoid predetermination because we never have all the info, we never have all the answers, and it's actually against special education law to predetermine, to make educational decisions before we have moved through that IEP process. That is the point uh, behind the IEP team concept. So the predetermination, uh, we'll get back there as well as we move through the course, but it's really important to avoid that. So we do have a discussion. You're going to look for a website with an assessment tool. It could be formal or informal. This is something that you've not already used. And you're just going to describe that assessment that you've identified with the four bullets here in mind. What is it? Who designed it? And then what's it testing? Is it reliable and valid? And would you use this? Why or why not? So also you'll want to try to get something that others have not used yet on the discussion board. Um, you may select an assessment that 
seems to be lacking and leaves a lot to be desired. And that's okay. It's good to look at bad ones too. Um, we don't want to just find every brilliant assessment ever because that leaves us nothing to criticize. So it never hurts to look for something that's a little weaker so that you can really point out those holes. And then as you encounter those down the road, you'll know what kinds of areas of improvement might be appropriate. So post as usual. The deadlines are in the course schedule. Have a great week.